Welcome to the second lecture of week 9 and last time we started with chapter 3 which is on uh, continuity and the setting is as follows. You have an interval i and a real valued function defined on this interval and then we uh, gave the definition of a function being continuous at a point c belonging to uh, its domain which is this interval i and we also explained what's meant by a function being continuous or continuous on i so it is then continuous at each and every point of i and we saw some examples and we saw that in some examples we had to do a lot of work to check continuity at a point for example the reciprocal function but then we learned this remarkable theorem which boils down checking continuity at a point to something happening with convergent sequences so we learned uh, this theorem which tells us that a function is continuous at a point c in its domain if and only if for every sequence xn in its domain this interval i which is convergent with limit c we have that this new sequence f of xn is convergent with limit f of c and we revisited the reciprocal function and we saw that indeed with the algebra of limits it was very easy to check this blue statement and hence we could reduce uh, the continuity of this reciprocal function. So what I want to do now is to give one more example of the use of this theorem but now to check that some function is not continuous at a certain point. So we'll check that this blue statement does not hold. Now this, this blue statement is saying that for every sequence in its domain which converges with limit c you have that f of xn is convergent with limit f of c. To, so to show that this blue statement does not hold, it's enough to just produce one sequence in the domain which converges to c all right, but f of xn does not converge to f of c. Okay, so the function that we are going to look at is something that we had seen earlier, namely this step function and sometimes it's also called the heaviside function after Oliver Heaviside, uh, an English mathematical physicist who uh, used it in his work. So let's recall what the function was. The function has the graph which looks like this. So for all x's which are less than or equal to 0, f of x is simply 0. And for x's which are positive, f of x is simply equal to 1. Okay. So uh, we had seen using the definition that the function is not continuous at 0. Indeed, there's a jump here in the graph. Okay. But we had checked this using the definition rigorously. And now I want to again deduce that the function is not continuous at 0 but I want to use this theorem to do so. Uh, so we'll assume that the function is continuous at 0 but we'll show that there is a sequence which converges to 0 but for which f of xn does not converge to f of 0 and f of 0 is 0. Okay? So uh, we want to produce a sequence in the domain which converges to 0 but for which f of um, that sequence f of xn does not converge to 0. Okay, So if I take my sequence uh, which converges to 0 as something approaching 0 from the left from over here, then f of the terms of the sequence, f of xn, since all the xn's are then negative, will just be 0. So f of xn will be the constant sequence 0, 0, 0, 0, which converges to 0, which is uh, f of 0. Okay, so that's not going to give us a contradiction. So of course, there are some sequences for which this blue statement works. But for continuity, for every sequence, this should work. And now we should demonstrate that there is one sequence for which it does not work. And to construct this sequence, it's just, as we just realized, it's not good to take all the terms as negative. So let's try something going to zero through positive values. Okay, so one example of such a sequence is this sequence whose nth term is given by 1 by n that we know converges to 0. We visibly see that. For example, when n is equal to 1, it might it is 1, which might be here. And then uh, when n is equal to 2, it is a half, then a third, a fourth, and so on. And this indeed converges to 0. We can see that visibly also. So this is a sequence which converges to c being 0 in the domain. Okay, And all of these are in the domain. They are real numbers. Now let's look at f of xn. If we assume that the function is continuous at 0, then f of xn, which is f of 1 by n, should converge to f of 0. Okay? And f of 0 is equal to 0. And what's f of 1 by n? Well, each of these 1 by n's is a positive number. 
and f of anything positive is 1. So this is actually the constant sequence 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, which of course converges to 1. The constant sequence with value 1 everywhere, of course, converges to 1. So this sequence, all right, on the one hand should converge to f of 0, which is 0, but we know that actually it converges to 1. So by the uniqueness of limits, any convergent sequence can have only one limit, we get the absurdity that 0 must be equal to 1, which is of course false. Okay? So this contradiction shows that our original assumption that the function is continuous at 0 cannot be true, so the function is not continuous at 0. So we showed that this statement is not true, because we produced a sequence, namely 1 by n, which converges to 0, but f of 1 by n, which turned out to be the constant sequence 1, 1, 1, converges to 1, and hence it cannot converge to f of c, f of 0, which is 0. Okay, So we showed that this statement does not hold by showing one sequence for which things go wrong. So uh, this blue statement does not hold, so the function is not continuous at 0. Okay. So let's look at one more example. This time we have a fairly complicated example and we'll show that it is continuous everywhere uh, using this theorem. I mean, via convergence of sequences. So uh, this will also motivate the theorem that we are soon going to learn on the algebra of continuous functions. So here is an example. You have a function f from r to r, which is defined like this. f of any real number x is given by uh, the ratio of two polynomials. The numerator polynomial is x square minus 3x plus 1 and the denominator is x square plus 1, okay, which is also a polynomial. First of all, is this function well defined? I mean, does this formula make sense? And the answer is yes, because if I have any real number, then x square will be non-negative. When you add 1 to it, you get a positive number. So its reciprocal is well defined. And the numerator is just some real number, namely the evaluation of this polynomial at x. So it's a ratio of two real numbers. The denominator is non-zero, in fact, positive. And so this is a well-defined number. We claim that this function is continuous everywhere. Okay, so to show continuity on this whole interval r, we have to show continuity at each and every point. So let's see be a real number. And we want to use this theorem so what we'll assume is that there is a sequence in its domain, which is the whole of the real line. So we have a real sequence, which converges to C. And then we want to find out if f of xn also converges to f of C. So suppose that xn is a sequence which converges to C. And f of xn, which is this combination, so the nth term is given like this, we want to show converges to f of C, which happens to be this one. Is that true? Well, first let's just look at the denominator. We know that xn converges to c, so we know that xn square converges to c square, and then xn square plus 1 converges to c square plus 1. Okay, So xn square plus 1 converges to c square plus 1, which is a positive number, right? because c square is non-negative, you add 1 to it, you get something positive. So that's a positive number, in particular non-zero. So then it follows that 1 divided by xn square plus 1 converges to 1 divided by c square plus 1 by the algebra of limits. Meanwhile, xn square minus 3xn plus, uh, plus 1, again by the algebra of limits, converges to c square minus 3c plus 1. So the numerator sequence converges to c square minus 3c plus 1 and 1 divided by xn square plus 1 converges to 1 divided by c square plus 1. So the product namely xn square minus 3xn plus 1 times 1 by xn square plus 1 converges to c square minus 3c plus 1 times 1 by c square plus 1. Okay, in other words, this f of xn converges to f of c. So what have we shown? If you take any sequence xn which converges to c, f of xn converges to f of c. And so by this uh, theorem, we have checked this blue statement, so it follows that the yellow statement is true. In other words, f is continuous at c. Okay, so since the function is continuous at c and since c was arbitrary, it follows that f is continuous on the whole of r because it's continuous at each and every c. All right, so uh, this was one more example. So this example anticipates a certain theorem which says that when we algebraically combine 
continuous functions then the result is also a continuous function so that's the theorem that we will learn next on the algebra of continuous functions but before we do so let's introduce some convenient notation so the setting is as follows you have an interval i and you have two functions f and g which are defined on this interval and they take real values so then we define f plus g from i to r as follows so this is a new function and since it's a function i should say what happens to each x in i so for any x in i f plus g this new function's value at x is defined by f of x plus g of x so if i take any x in i this is a real number fx and gx is also a real number i add them up and that's what is the value of this new function f plus g at the point x okay so for each x in i so this new function is called the pointwise sum of f and g similarly you can define the pointwise product of f and g which is this new function denoted by f dot g that again goes from i to r and it is defined like this f dot g at x is simply fx times gx so fx and gx are both real numbers you multiply them you get a new real number and that's what is the value of this pointwise product function of f and g at the point x okay and similarly if alpha is any real number then the new function alpha times f denoted like this alpha dot f okay that's just the notation for this new function uh, is again a new function from i to r which is defined like this alpha dot f at x is simply alpha the real number alpha multiplied by f of x for each x in i similarly the pointwise absolute value of the function f which is denoted by mod f that's the notation for a new function from i to r whose value at x is simply mod of f of x for each x in i and similarly if k is any natural number then the kth power of f is the new function going from i to r whose value at x is simply the kth power of f of x for all x in i and finally if for each x in i g of x is not equal to 0 then we define a new function 1 by g sort of the pointwise reciprocal of the function g 1 by g that is a new function from i to r which is defined like this 1 by g at x is 1 divided by gx for all x's in i notice that for any x in i gx is a non-zero number and so 1 by gx is a well-defined real number and that's what is taken as the value of this pointwise reciprocal function at x okay so with this notation in hand we are now ready to prove uh, the following theorem which uh, can be thought of as uh, a theorem on the algebra of continuous functions Roughly speaking, it says that when we algebraically combine continuous functions, the result is again a continuous function. So the precise statement is as follows. So suppose that i is an interval in R and c is a point belonging to this interval i and f and g are two functions which are real valued living on this interval which are continuous at c. Then this theorem says that uh, the following functions are also continuous. First of all, the pointwise sum of f and g is continuous at c. The pointwise product of f and g is continuous at c. For any real number alpha, the scaled version of f, alpha times f, is also continuous at c. The pointwise absolute value of the function f is continuous at c. For any k, a natural number, the kth power of f is continuous at c. So f square, f cube, and so on. All of these are continuous too. And uh, if the function g is such that for each x in i, gx is not equal to 0, so then we can talk about this pointwise reciprocal function 1 by g, that's a well-defined function. Well, that function is also continuous at c, thanks to g being continuous at c. So we will now prove this. There are, of course, six statements to prove, uh, and the proofs are very similar for each of them basically we use the algebra of uh, limits and the characterization of continuity via convergent sequences okay so let's just prove one of these statements and since the proof for the others are very similar uh, you can either read the proof in the notes or try your own hand at it so let's for example prove the first statement namely that if f and g are two continuous functions at c then their pointwise sum this new function f plus g is also continuous at c 
So to do this, we will use the algebra of limits and the characterization of continuity via this convergence of sequences. So let's assume that you have a sequence xn, which is contained in i. So for each n, xn belongs to i and xn converges to c. Now, since f is continuous at c, we know that f of xn converges to f of c. Similarly, since g is continuous at c, g of xn converges to g of c. But now we can just add these two. Uh, so the term-wise sum of these two convergent sequences by the algebra of limits we know is also convergent with the limit being the sum of the two limits. So by the algebra of limits we know that the sequence whose nth term is fxn plus gxn converges with limit fc plus gc. But fxn plus g of xn is exactly what the pointwise sum of the two functions is at the point xn. You see, by the definition of how we define this new function f plus g, f plus g at xn is simply by definition fxn plus gxn. And so, you know, this is the same as this sequence uh, that converges to, and likewise, this fc plus gc is nothing but f plus g uh, acting on c by the definition of how we define the pointwise sum of two functions. So what we have got at the end of the day is that whenever you have a sequence xn in the domain which converges to a point c in the domain, we have that f plus g acting on the nth term, the, the sequence you get in that way converges to f plus g acting on the limit. Okay, So what we have verified is exactly this blue statement for the new function f plus g. We have shown that whenever you have a sequence xn in i which converges to c, f plus g of xn converges to f plus g of c. Okay, And hence we can conclude that f plus g is continuous at c. Okay, So let's go back to where we were. So what we have uh, seen is that since xn uh, for any sequence xn in i which is convergent with limit c, f plus g acting on xn converges to f plus g at c, it follows that f plus g is continuous at c. And the other claims are proved analogously. For example, with the pointwise product, you uh, have again this sequence converges to fc, gxn converges to gc, but then you just take the term-wise product of these two and that will uh, converge to the product of these two limits. Okay, But that product of uh, these two limits is simply fg acting on c and similarly the term-wise product of this is nothing but the pointwise product of the two functions acting on xn. So you immediately get that fg is continuous at c and similarly the other things too. Okay, you, Each time you use the algebra of limits and that theorem which characterizes continuity in terms of convergence of sequences. Okay, So uh, we will use this theorem freely. So let's see an example of the use of this theorem where we will show that an important class of functions is continuous, namely all polynomial functions are continuous. So what are polynomial functions? Well, roughly speaking, they are just linear combinations of power functions. So what do I mean by that? Uh, well, the simplest function is, of course, uh, a constant function. For example, the constant function which sends every real number to 1. Another simple function that we have met is the identity function, where each real number x is sent to x itself. Let's call that function f. Since this is a very simple function, we can also look at the term-wise uh, kth power of this function, which is this power function, x being sent to x to the power k, where k is a natural number. For example, the quadratic function, x being sent to x square, or x being sent to x cubed, the cubic function, and so on. Okay, so these are called the power functions. They are also very simple. So because the constant function is continuous and we have seen that the identity function is continuous and because of that also these power functions are continuous by the theorem that we have just learned. Now polynomial functions are linear combinations of these power functions by which we mean that we take a bunch of real numbers as coefficients c0, c1 up to cd, d plus 1 numbers and define the function p, which is a, a real valued function uh, living on this interval r, the whole real line, and it's defined like this. p of x is c0 times 1 plus c1 times x plus c2 times x square plus c3 times x cube all the way up till cd times xd. 
So what we have at hand is the constant function, the identity function's value, the quadratic, and then powers of the identity, the kth powers of the identity, where k runs from uh, 1 up to d. And then we have multiplied them by some fixed real numbers. So we have scaled them, and then we have added these up. Okay, So that's referred to as a linear combination of these power functions. So the polynomial function is a linear combination of the power functions, and we immediately know, thanks to the uh, algebra of continuous functions, that these polynomial functions are continuous. Why? Because we know that the constant function is continuous, the identity function is continuous, hence these power functions are continuous. If I scale them by some fixed real number, then that's also continuous. And when I add two continuous functions, you again get a continuous function, because of which when I add these continuous functions, I end up with a continuous function. So polynomials are continuous functions. Okay, so now we'll show that the restriction of continuous functions is continuous. So we will first explain what's meant by the restriction of a function, and then we will prove this result. So first of all, what's meant by the restriction of a function? So the setting is like this. You have an interval i and another interval j, such that j is contained in i. So whenever I take any x in j, it automatically belongs to i. So the sort of pictorially, you have an interval i, and then j is sort of a subinterval, a subset of i. And you have also a function from i to r. Then we are now going to define what's meant by the restriction of this function to this smaller interval j. Okay. So by the restriction of f to this smaller interval j, we mean a new function, which is defined on j. And this new function will denote by this symbol. Okay, and it is read as the restriction of f to j. And that is defined as follows. So whenever I take a x in j, I should explain what is f restricted to j at that x. Well, that's simply defined as f of x. If x is in j, then certainly it's in i as well. So fx makes sense. And whatever real number you get, that's the restriction of f to j is at the point x. All right, so that's what is meant by um, the restriction of f to this subinterval. You just restrict the function's domain, and otherwise you use the same values of the old function. And the theorem that we are now going to show, it's uh, almost a triviality, which says that whenever the function is continuous on that big interval, then its restriction to the smaller interval is continuous as well. Okay, So to show that the restriction of f to j is continuous on j, we should show continuity at each and every point of j. So let C be a point in j. Well, then C is certainly a point in i as well. And since the function is continuous on i, it's continuous at each and every point of i. So in particular, it's continuous at this C. What does that mean? That means that given any positive epsilon, there exists a positive delta such that whenever x in i satisfies that its distance to C is less than delta, I'm guaranteed that the distance of f of x to f of c is less than epsilon. Okay. Now, if you just read this part of the sentence, then we see that for every x in i, something happens. Okay. But then this also happens for every x in j, because whenever x is in j, it's also in i. Okay. So uh, to repeat, what we have is that for every epsilon positive, there exists a positive delta, such that for all x's in j, you have this holding that whenever the distance of x to c is less than delta, you have that mod f of x uh, minus f of c is less than epsilon. But if x is in j, this f of x is precisely how we define the restriction of f to j at x to b. right? So this red thing f of x when x is in j is just the restriction of f to j at x. So if I read this sentence again, what we have shown is that for every epsilon positive, there exists a positive delta such that for all x's in j, whenever the distance of x to c is less than delta, you have that the distance of the restriction of f to j at x to f of c is less than epsilon. So the restriction of f to j is continuous at c, but the choice of c in j was arbitrary, so it follows that the restriction of f to j is continuous on the whole of j. Okay. So let's see an example of this uh, theorem. and. Uh, we'll revisit the reciprocal function. So recall the reciprocal function was the map which sends x to 1 by x for x is in this half line from 0 to infinity. And we had seen that this is continuous uh, 
in two ways one by using the definition and the other uh, using the characterization of continuity via convergent sequences but now uh, let's see a different proof where we use the continuity of the identity function and then the restriction of that and then the algebra of uh, continuous functions so let's look at the identity function let's call it f this is the map which sends x to itself we have seen that this is continuous on the whole of r now since this zero infinity this open interval is a sub interval of the real line we also know that the restriction of f to zero infinity is continuous on this half line but what is the restriction well it's defined like this the restriction of f to zero infinity at x is simply f of x which is x right and since x is uh, in zero infinity this x is positive in particular not equal to zero now since this restriction function is not equal to zero point wise we can talk about its point wise reciprocal function which is one divided by this restriction function okay so since this function is continuous we know that its reciprocal function is also continuous so we know that this function is continuous on zero infinity and actually this function is precisely what the reciprocal function is because what is the value of this function at any x it is just one divided by the value of this function at x which is nothing but x itself so it is the this map is the map which sends x in zero infinity to one by x and so it's what we had called the reciprocal function earlier and since this function was continuous its restriction was continuous so by the algebra of continuous functions its re pointwise reciprocal function was also continuous in other words this function is continuous so this is not really a new proof because while proving the algebra of continuous functions we actually use the algebra of limits and uh, the characterization of continuous functions via convergent sequences so the next result that we are going to learn about is that the composition of continuous functions is continuous so uh, first we'll explain what is meant by the composition of functions so the setting is as follows suppose that i and j are two intervals f is a function from i to r whose range is contained in j so, or the range or the image so what's uh, that well that i denote by f of i and it's the collection of all f of x's where x belongs to i okay so that's exactly what is the range of the this function f or the image of this function f so we are assuming that the image of this function is contained in j hmm. and g is a function which is defined on this j so then the composition g of f it is denoted with this little circle between the two g composed with f from i to r is defined as follows so, so since this is a new function i have to explain what its action is on any x belonging to i well g composed with f at x is simply defined by g acting on f of x well does that make sense f of x is something in the range of f but we are assuming that the range of f is contained in j and that's good because g eats points in j and produces real numbers so since this is a element of the domain of g g can act on it and produce a real number so g composed with f at x is simply g acting on f of x for all x's in i so sort of pictorially here is i here is the interval j and the first function f is such that this i is mapped to some set within j so you can think of that set as for example being this purple set that's what the range of f is for example and then g can a act on any of these blue points in particular it can act on the uh, the range of f these points which are produced over here and it can produce a real number and g composed with f then is the following map you first take any x in i you look at what f of x is that will be in the uh, domain of g because we are assuming that the range of f is contained in the domain of g and so g can act on this f of x and produce a real number that's what g of f of x is and that's what you define to be as g of f acting on x so instead of sort of uh, you first hop here and then you hop here and then you think of that as one hop via this function g of f so 
what we are saying is that if f and g happen to be continuous then also their composition is continuous so now we are ready to prove the theorem which says that the composition of continuous functions is continuous so sort of more precisely uh, let i and j be two intervals g is a function from j to r f is a function from i to r such that its range or the image of f is contained in the domain of g f is continuous at c g is continuous at f of c and let's notice that f of c is of course in the range which is in the domain of g so it makes sense to talk about the continuity of g at this point in its domain then the conclusion is that g composed with f is continuous at c okay so let's prove this so we'll use the sort of sequential characterization of continuity to prove this so suppose that xn is any sequence uh, in the domain of g of f which converges to c so i know that for each n xn belongs to i and xn moreover converges to c now since f is continuous at c we know that f of xn converges to f of c and let's notice that this f of c belongs to the range of f which is contained in this interval j which is the domain of g moreover each of these f of xn's that also belongs to the range of f which is contained in j so each of these uh, belongs to j okay so what we know is that f of xn is in f of i which is in j for each n now since g is continuous at f of c here is a sequence f of xn which converges to a point in its domain and each term of the sequence is also something in its domain so since g is continuous at f of c we know that g acting on this nth term that gives a new sequence which converges to g acting on the limit which is this fc okay so what does this mean well g of f of xn is exactly what g of f is on xn and g of uh, f of c is nothing but g composed with f at the point c so what we have got is that whenever you take a sequence xn in the domain of g of f which converges to c i have that g of f acting on the nth term of that sequence that new sequence you get is convergent to g of f acting on c so this exactly means uh, because of the characterization on continuity via convergent sequences that g of f is continuous at c okay so this proves this theorem and uh, let's see an important consequence of this so let's see an example of this let's look at the two functions f and g where f is simply the polynomial function which sends x to 1 plus x square and we know that it's continuous and the function g is the reciprocal function so it sends any x in this open interval 0 infinity to 1 by x and we have seen that that's also continuous now let's look at the range or the image of this f well that's the collection of all uh, f of x's where x belongs to r in other words it's the set of all 1 plus x square where x belongs to r now since x is a real number its square is a non-negative real number when you add 1 to it you get a positive number right so this range is a collection of positive numbers so it's a subset of zero infinity so by the theorem that we have just learned their composition is a continuous function so g composed with f is well defined and it is a continuous function on the whole of r and what is this g of x well g of f at any x in r is g of f of x but f of x is 1 plus x square okay and that's a positive number so g of that is defined and g of anything is the reciprocal of that so this is equal to 1 divided by 1 plus x square so the composition of g with f g of f at x is by 1 plus x square where x belongs to r and now we know that this function is continuous so more generally if you have a polynomial q which is positive on an interval just like 1 plus x square in the previous example was positive on an interval then its pointwise reciprocal is going to be a continuous function and if you have p any polynomial then well the pointwise product of p with the pointwise reciprocal of uh, q is going to be continuous in other words all rational functions are continuous whenever the denominator is positive on an interval okay
So uh, actually the positivity is not that important. For example, even if this were negative uh, on an interval, the same thing would be true. Okay. So the, the proof is uh, quite similar to what we have just done in the example. Let's do one last uh, example of a combination of continuous functions being continuous. And here the setting is like this. You have an interval i and two functions f and g which are defined on this interval taking real values which are called the maxi pointwise maximum of f and g and the pointwise minimum of f and g. So the pointwise maximum of f and g is this new function denoted like this max f comma g which is defined on i taking real values and is defined like this. For any x in i max f comma g at x is the maximum of f of x and g of x okay so it's sort of the pointwise maximum so f of x is a real number g of x is a real number you take the maximum of these two real numbers that's some real number and that's what uh, the pointwise maximum of f and g at x is defined to be similarly the pointwise minimum of f and g is defined like this minimum of f and g at x is minimum of f of x and g of x where x belongs to i so sort of pictorially this f might be this blue function graph shown like this and g might be the function whose graph looks like this this red thing and what does the maximum pointwise maximum of f and g look like well for any x for example x over here you look at the larger of the two values well that's the red value so that's what maximum of f and g will be at this point but over here for example at this x the maximum of f and g at that x will be this blue point okay so uh, the graph of the pointwise maximum of f and g then looks like this first it will be this because the red thing is bigger then it will be this follow this blue curve then it will follow this red curve then it will follow this blue curve then it will follow this red curve and then the blue curve okay so you get this violet or purple thing as the graph of the ma uh, pointwise maximum of f and g. Similarly, if one function was f and the other function was ident the function which is constant equal to zero everywhere, then the minimum of f and zero will look like this. Well, here f is positive, so it will uh, the minimum pointwise minimum of f and zero at uh, places over here will be just zero. Okay, so it will be zero. But then here f is negative, so it will follow this. Then it will be zero then it will be this, then it will be zero, then it will be this, and then it will be zero. Okay, so the graph of the minimum, pointwise minimum of f and zero looks like this, this violet curve. Okay, all right, so uh, we will soon show that the pointwise maximum of two continuous functions and the pointwise minimum of two continuous functions is also continuous, but to do so, it will be handy to first prove the following lemma. And this was an exercise in chapter one, but it was not assigned. So let's quickly do this exercise. So this lemma says that if a and b are two real numbers, then the maximum of a and b can be expressed like this. It's a plus b plus the modulus of a minus b divided by two. And similarly, the minimum of a and b is a plus b minus the modulus of a minus b divided by two. So let's first check this formula indicated by this blue bullet. So let's consider the case when a is bigger than or equal to b. Then this left hand side is simply a. The maximum of a and b when a is bigger than or equal to b is a. What's the right hand side? Well, that's a plus b plus mod a minus b by 2. But if a is bigger than or equal to b, this modulus, so a minus b is then a non-negative number. So its modulus is itself. So this is just a minus b. The b cancels, leaving an a. Okay. So, and what about the case when a is strictly less than b? Well, then the maximum of a and b, since a is strictly less than b, is b. And what about the right hand side? Well, a plus b plus mod a minus b by 2. When b is strictly bigger than a, this is negative. So the mod of this will be the minus of a minus b, which is b minus a. Now the a cancels, leaving a b. Okay, so this formula is true both for a bigger than or equal to b and for a less than b. So it's true. And likewise, you can also check for yourself that the minimum of uh, a and b is given by this formula. Again, considering the two cases when a is bigger than or equal to b and when a is strictly less than b.
Okay, so I won't do that. It's very easy. Uh, so you can pause the video and do it yourself. But once you have this, then you see the pointwise maximum of f and g can be expressed like this. So that by definition for any x in i is the maximum of these two real numbers f of x and g of x and by this lemma this is just f of x plus g of x plus mod of f of x minus g of x divided by 2. And we recognize this. This is just uh, in our earlier notation uh, we can express this in terms of pointwise operations. So this is just f plus g plus mod f minus g divided by 2. Okay, so that function. So the maximum of f and g is nothing but this combination of the functions f and g. Similarly, the minimum of f and g is this combination of f and g. So now the theorem is that if i is any interval and f and g are two continuous functions, then the maximum of pointwise maximum of f and g and the pointwise minimum of f and g are continuous. Well, since f and g are continuous, we know that their pointwise sum and their pointwise difference are continuous by the algebra of continuous functions. And then if I take the absolute value of this continuous function, the uh, pointwise absolute value of this continuous function, that's also continuous. So I know these two are continuous. So their pointwise sum and pointwise difference are continuous. And then if I scale it by half, that's also continuous. But this is exactly what the pointwise maximum of f and g is. And this is exactly what the pointwise minimum of f and g is. And so these two functions are also continuous. All right, so we'll stop here. And next time what we will, next week, what we will do is uh, these two very important theorems, namely the ex intermediate value theorem and the extreme value theorem. Both of these are about continuous functions on a compact interval. So a bounded interval where the endpoints are included. And the intermediate value theorem says that if you have a continuous function defined on a compact interval, and if you take any intermediate value y between the endpoint values, then it's attained. So there exists some c in the compact interval such that f of c is equal to this intermediate value. And the extreme value theorem says that if you have a continuous function on a compact interval, then the range of this function is bounded, is a bounded set. So it has an upper bound and a lower bound. Moreover, the range is not empty. So it has a least upper bound and a greatest lower bound, a supremum and an infimum. And this extreme value theorem says that these extreme values are in fact attained. So they themselves belong to the range. So there exist C and D in this compact interval such that f of c is exactly the supremum of the range and f of d is exactly the infimum of the range. Okay, So we'll state these two theorems precisely next time and we'll prove these two. So these are properties which are possessed by continuous functions on compact intervals which are not possessed by any old function. Okay, all right, so we'll stop here.